Hey guys, welcome back to the Grant Mitt Podcast, episode number 75. We have special guests here today. We have the School of Hard Knocks co-founders here today, James, Jack, and Josh. Welcome to the episode. I'm excited to have you guys. Thanks for having us on, brother. It's great to be yes, here. Yes, sir. What's going on, guys? It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Awesome. Well, so a little bit about the School of Hard Knocks. So you guys in the last three years have built an unbelievable platform. It, I, I can't imagine even having social media without at least seeing one of y'all's videos one time. I can't imagine that. But in the last three years, you guys have built a platform that has over 4 million followers across all your different platforms. And just specifically, I think in the last, what, six months, how much have you guys grown? I can tell you in the last 30 days on Instagram alone, we've gone up 550,000. 550,000. You came in the last 30 days on IG alone, but six months, I, I, we've at least doubled for sure. At least doubled, you know, I think we probably had around 2 million cumulatively and then now it's about, I think a little over 4 million now. And how many views have you guys had just in the last month on I Instagram? Think, so in the last three, in the last three years, we've done about 1.5 billion views. And then in the last, I know, uh, month we did uh, 80 million views on Instagram, 26 million views on TikTok, and I think 15 million views on Facebook and um, probably a couple mil on, on YouTube as well. Yeah. So tell me about the growth. What, first off, like what, what made you guys just who came up with the idea? Were y'all just all hanging out? Yeah. What, like what happened? What made you guys want to start this, uh, this channel and this company? Yeah. So the three of us grew up in the Washington DC area. Um, we met, we were in the same Boy Scout troop. Jack and I are brothers. Um, being that we were from the, the DC, Northern Virginia area, if anybody's ever been there or knows anything about, uh, you know, that side of the, uh, the country, it's very structured and strict. Everybody that's growing up there, they're born into that mindset that the epitome of success is gonna be that six-figure government job, that contracting job, going to work for a federal agency, Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, Department of Justice, going to politics. I tell people all the time, you wanna go be a legislative correspondent, go work on Capitol Hill, go to DC. That's the place to be and that's the place to break in. But if you wanna do your own thing, the only shot you have at being a successful entrepreneur in DC is starting like a home interior design company or a construction company. It's just not a collaborative place and so, one thing that I know that you've preached a lot in a lot of your content and seeing you in videos is that you got to get the fuck out of your hometown, mm. right? When you know that like you're not going to be able to grow there. And we all had that similar mindset that we wanted to do our own thing and had similar values and, and morals as far as like we wanted to do it the right and the honest way. And so Jack had moved out to Austin. Five yeah, years yeah ago. Pretty, pretty much moved out to Austin about five, six years ago to go to UT Austin. Uh, had some crazy you know, opportunities while I was out here, I was working with uh, Bucky's for a little bit of time, right. uh, doing some consulting on the side, uh, doing kind of like database, uh, software Excel projects, uh, and kind of through that kind of launched myself into entrepreneurship. And then, you know, I know Josh was pretty busy as well back in Nova. Yeah, yeah, I was going to college for a little bit. And then uh, while I was in college, I started a digital marketing company. So it got to the point where I was like, I was either gonna do my homework or my, my client work. And I was like, I, I kind of like making money more, right. you know, I don't, I don't care about the X, X over Y or anything like that. So uh, ended up pursuing the uh, digital marketing company and reconnected with these guys uh, at a kickback one day. Yeah. So and then just kind of give you a little bit of uh, context on like what I was doing is so going into my senior year of high school, I grew up my entire life wanting to go the military route. I wanted to go special ops. Our dad had an incredible career in the army. He ran the largest overseas military base in the world. He was wow. the garrison commander of Camp Humphrey, South Korea. So we grew up watching our dad lead tens of thousands of people. He's one of the sharpest leaders that, that I've ever met, you know, and still just that discipline in us at a very early age. But, you know, around 2019, late 2019 hits, and we see TikTok hit. And that's around the time when, if you, if you were on TikTok in 2019, man, people would have thought you were a little sweet. You know what I mean? Like, let's be honest. <laughs> it was embarrassing man. at first. A a everybody called it the dancing app and all that. But whereas everybody viewed it as that way, I saw it as an opportunity to create something great because I was seeing all these young 20 year old kids who were making content about things that they were passionate about, all types of different backgrounds, and they were monetizing it, making tens of thousands and even millions of dollars just through the content creation. And so, uh, and, 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 you, and when you do research on industries in today's world, you see that that's the, one of the fastest growing industries, digital marketing, paid advertising, it's become very cluttered. A lot of it's going to that organic space. And quite frankly, in the space that we're in, if you think about like interviews, right? Big leaders, they're tired of doing interviews on like CNN and Fox. Every, that traditional media is shifting to, you know, the more the social, the more raw feel of things. And so I got really savvy in 2019, 2020 about, uh, you know, creating content. And I grew my personal TikTok to about 850,000 followers in, in about a year or so uh, and was just so consistent and dialed in. And so right before I had made the decision to move out to Austin to go to UT, you know, to be with Jack, kind of following his footsteps and moving to Austin, he actually, I think Josh was the one that had pitched us the idea of like, hey, look, 
we all kind of had these similar, you know, background, like, let's, let's do something together. We didn't know what it was at first, but eventually we were in Austin, got on a couple calls, we landed on, let's do something in media, let's do something in content. We understood the algorithm and, and, and had a passion for business. And so we just started, it was the three of us just making content about business. Quickly realized that most people out there don't give a shit about three young 20 year old kids talking about business. We knew we could scale this thing up so much faster if we brought the experts in. So what we would do is just start going downtown Austin to the tech district, to the financial district, and just having conversations with people, trying to get insights. And eventually from then on, you know, I think our first interview did 100,000 views and we're like, okay, let's just keep doing the supply and pressure here. And it was like every single interview that we posted was just 100,000 100, views plus on TikTok. Uh, and, and from there, we were just like, you know, that's the winning piece of content. And, you know, the biggest thing we probably learned up front is that once you find that winning piece of content that consistently is hitting, you need to kind of weed out all the other stuff that's not working and really go 10x all in on that. And so that pit, we, we kind of look back at that pivot of focusing away from us and making videos ourselves to putting the spotlight on other people. Probably one of the most pivotal pivots we ever made that led to us uh, growing the audience that we have today. Yeah. What was interesting, too, and this is important because a lot of people say, well, you know, I can't start making content or I don't, you know, my business small. I'll, I'll, I'll focus on that stuff in a couple of years once I make more money. You guys were at the time, what, how old when you I first started? Probably like 20, 21. 18, yeah, yeah 18, 19. Okay, so you're, you're basically broke college kids and you're walking around. You didn't know anybody, I mean, maybe a few people here and there, but you would literally just walk in downtown Austin with your iPhone and just record random people. Yes. That's and that's how, how it started. started. That's how it started. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that ends up being the best content because sometimes I know you guys, we talk about this all the time is that you put all your work into this one little content and it's edited perfectly. And sometimes that just real authentic, natural interaction or last second you make something real quick ends up going the most viral. I think it's also interesting of like, you know, you get a lot of friends who are like, oh, I need all the right equipment for, you know, me to get set up and in order to be successful in content creation. And the reality is all you need is an iPhone. All you, it, has, it has the mic that you need. It has the camera that you need. I mean, modern technology is so good that you could accomplish just about anything you need just through an iPhone. And we grew to, I mean, a seven figure plus following with just our iPhone. With no cool equipment, no big money, just you guys out hustling talking to people yes uh, and, and, and it was it was every day you know we, we weren't in class at least a couple of days a week we would be downtown for hours just going up to create the content but that's the thing is we had that bigger picture thought all along that we're like hey as long as we stayed consistent at this you know i had seen it on my personal channel um that like hey like you just do it it's going to compound and you're gonna just you can really explode this thing yeah absolutely so early on okay what was the first big video that was like a big known person that we know that the audience would know that yeah. really hit. Yeah. We, uh, we interviewed Mark Cuban back in 2021 at South by Southwest. How did, Austin, how did that happen? So Mark Cuban just finished up a speaking event and you know he was having a conversation with someone outside and I, Jack looks at me and he goes, holy shit, it's Mark Cuban. He goes, it's Mark Cuban, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, like, like we have to go do this, right? Take the risk or lose the chance. And so we go up to him, approach him, say, hey, Mark, you know, my brother and I, we started a channel out here in Austin, Texas, going to school at UT. You know, we go all over the country just asking people a few questions on some of their best advice to the younger generation. Would love to ask you a few questions for the channel. And he's like, let's do it. And so did the interview with him, got a couple million views on a couple different platforms. And so that was like the first pivotal one. And I, the biggest takeaway from Mark is that he said that, you know, I asked him like the advice he would tell his younger self. And it was that no matter what you're doing, no matter what business you're in, just be a salesperson, learn how to sell. And that's, again, one of the most common themes of the most successful people is that no matter what industry that you're in, you need to know how to sell. Mm, that's interesting. So what ended up happening? Because I think right after that first year, obviously the, the channel, and the media company started making a name for itself. And I noticed you guys started networking and connecting with not just the main entrepreneurs that everybody knows, but just hyper successful seven, eight, nine, ten, even billionaires all across the United States. How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, it, it was really a combination of things. The channel started to get a ton of traction. We had people that were reaching out to us. That we'd reach out to other people and we just got really good at utilizing our network to 
we got really good at utilizing our network to continue plugging us with other people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the most important things is that there's a big misconception about wealthy people that, you know, that they're bitter. And when in reality, it's, it's, it's the opposite, in my opinion. I think broke people are the most bitter people in the world. But wealthy people are genuinely some of the most willing people to, to provide help. And so we would just tap into our network and be like, hey, we have a clear value add for other people here, whether they want exposure to talk about their business or just in general, just give that advice to, to younger people out there. And so that's what it was, is just continuing to tap into our networks and not being afraid to reach out. Like you're one message away. And oftentimes, again, like once you start to get in the room with some of these billionaires, ultra successful people, so you're really one degree separation away from just about anybody, anybody. in the world. You know? Anybody. I also think one of the changes that happened along the way is just slight pivots of branding. Because it started out with us just doing, like, it would just be you in the, in the frame and there was no one in there. But people buy from people and people like invest in people. So what we started to do is that the three of us started to get within the videos. And so that way it's like, okay, people know that like this is a school of hard knocks, that is a school of hard knocks. And so we put, you know, they'd be able to put a name to a face as well as we'd put our branding of like the actual logo itself within the videos. So that way they saw every time that logo in there, it's a hard knocks video and they knew that. Yeah, it was, it was funny as soon as, as soon as we put that logo on there, we stopped seeing a lot of our videos getting taken from uh, just a bunch of random accounts. I know you've experienced that oh, as yeah. well with your stuff, um, just putting videos out there and it, just getting broadcasted. But P P people will still find a way to crop that video out. So they should <laughs> logos out in there though, you know? Something, yeah. What about, so what do you think though? Okay, so besides out there and doing the work and just hustling every day, what do you think it takes to really grow a social media account from a zero to a million followers? So if your main focus and your business is going to be social media, you really have to lose your mind to what you're doing and really become obsessed with it. We could not go anywhere. We could go to an ice cream shop, a sub shop. We could go on, on a cruise we were going to get an interview with somebody. If you saw somebody that had the look that looked like they had some value, we were going to walk up to them and get that interview. So that's almost what it was like is that we could not stop plotting and thinking about like, mm -hmm. man, what is this next great piece of content that we can create? And oftentimes, and that's the thing too, is we love, we love doing it. And, and a lot of times people, they make content just to like go viral or whatnot. But again, Josh Terry, who's a creator out in Austin, gave the piece of advice to us that it's like, you want to make the content that's going to make you want to create the next piece of content. Otherwise, you'll burn out very quickly. And so mm -hmm. since we love doing it, we were able to be relentless about going to spend hours out to like get this content. And so initially, I'm a big proponent of it's, it's quantity over quality early on. It's all volume. Unless you're putting out Steven Spielberg like level content, you need to be focused on just maximum uh, volume because I always talk about you got person A and B, let's say that they're creating content about real estate. And let's say that one person, person A is posting once a week, come to the end of that week, got seven pieces of content out. But person B, he's putting out three pieces of content a day, 21 pieces versus seven pieces of content. It's, it's you know, volume negates luck at the end of the day. So it's like, yeah, that person may have one piece uh, that goes viral, but that person's gonna have way more shots at, at hitting the algorithm and hitting uh, a video big. I would say once you begin to scale, it turns into a lot more about quality. So like when we were starting out in that first year, there was not a single day that we did not post a minimum of three times. It didn't mm. matter where we were on a plane, on a train, we made sure to get multiple pieces of content out every single day. Now it's like you scale back and I hear Keith Lee, he's a food creator, has probably over 10 million followers. He talks about how when he was first coming up on, on TikTok and social media that it would be where he'd post three or four times a day. And now it's like you get to that point where it's not necessarily creating the scarcity, but in a sense of it's like you want people to just kind of crave your content. So you're just mm. putting out the craziest content possible. And like I said, we were talking about this earlier. I, I will say I won't put a video out unless I know it can get 500,000 views. And that includes if we're working with a brand. Like I, I, I won't rush it. We're going to put out the best content possible to always keep people coming back. I think there's a, a couple points that I'd actually like to touch on that. A lot of the times when people are starting out creating content, they get burned out very quickly because they see you know, people on TikTok, they'll post one or two videos, especially back in the old TikTok alg algorithm where they'd post one or two videos and they get 100,000 views. Well, as the platforms get more saturated, it's going to become a lot harder to do that. And so not everybody's, you know, met and crafted to have that just viral sensation out the gate. You have to start building that trust with the audience, especially with what we've seen with personal brands. And so a lot of times people are going to, they're going to start posting. Like for example, our Instagram account, we had posted 200 times and had still had less than a hundred followers. Uh, on, and now it's at 1.6 million today uh, at two at 2000 posts. Yeah. So, you know, if you're creating content and you're, you know, you post a hundred times and you really believe in what you're doing, it's not necessarily that it's not working out. It's that maybe you need to start pivoting, which would probably be my second point is that in addition to, it's going to take a little bit longer than you think, because not everyone's a viral sensation. 
uh, you got to know those pivots, kind of like Josh talked about. If something's not working, you really need to just like figure out, let me give my audience something else and see how they respond to it. Just experiment. That's like cool. he was saying, like putting out several pieces of content a day. When we had first started doing the videos, like it was just us filming and recording. And eventually when we put the focus on someone else, that's what took off. And so we realized, okay, you know, let's stop making those videos about ourselves. Let's actually start making the videos about them. And, you know, if you're making content and you throw that new piece of content there, it goes viral. Stop doing the other crap. The audience wants to see what they want to see. Squeeze everything you can out of the best content. Yeah. Yes. And I'll, I'll add one more thing on this. I think one of the most important things and, and probably some of the best advice that I could give on content creation is that you have to be an innovator in whatever niche that you're in. So for example, now, if you go to Miami in Brickell, Florida, there's 40 kids that are trying to do interviews on the street. Literally. And if anybody's been to Miami, that's a fact. It looks like a bunch of NPCs. But, <laughs> but I'll tell you, like three weeks from now, none of them are gonna be there. But I would say the biggest thing that we did to really stand out is that I would say since we started about three years ago, we were pretty interview on, we like to call it like the street interview culture, right? Just a couple of street interviews with a dream is, is like what we like to call it. Uh -huh. But in reality, um, when we were just doing the street interviews, again, it started faceless where we went in the videos, but then it got to, okay, let's get in the videos and let's start to kind of put a face on it. Oh, but now let's not even ask people, but let's literally just record us walking up to them to kind of create that more entertainment. So I'd say like probably like the OG in our niche was probably Daniel Mack. Now granted, Daniel Mack is, it's, I would say his content is really purely like entertainment, right? You're getting a lot of like entertainment out of that. Whereas like, we're trying to mix that, like creating the entertainment of going up to jets, yachts, cars, or even just like asking people questions. Like if they've, if they've been broke, if they've gone into debt, how much money do they make? Like those types of things to make it really engaging, especially those hooks, most important part of the video. But we would constantly just be an innovator in that street interview niche. So when we started out, it would just be us asking questions. Now let's walk up to people. Let's go to people on a bench, coming out of a store, coming out of a big building. Like we were constantly thinking about, okay, what can we do now? We asked these questions. Okay, what can we add into the arsenal? And, and kind of just keep kind of like innovating. Cause that's the thing is like, once people see your content enough, it's, it's the same thing over and over again. Mm. And that's why we emphasize with other people too. It's like, even if you're not doing like, so interviews is a great style of content because you can constantly get different knowledge from different people. But if you're the sole person making your content, it can be hard sometimes to kind of innovate and kind of do that. And that's why it's like, try scroll stoppers, try different videos where like you're walking out of building, starting the video, or opening up a can, something like that to really captivate people. So I would just always say, no matter what type of content you're making, you have to be an innovator in whatever niche that you're in. Yeah. And I feel like with, with every level, there's a new devil, you know, well, at 150 K we plateaued there for, I think three or four months. And we were just like, what can we do to break out of this slump? And we were stuck. And what we had to realize is we had to go back to the drawing board. And even if you've had success and you've got to a certain level, there's always going to be, a, you know, a new challenge to break. And, you know, and it's, so it's always like, OK, let me look at to see what, what my competitors are doing. But also you got to go a little bit beyond that as well, because sometimes some of the best inspiration you can get is from people that are making content in, a, in an industry or a niche that's completely unrelated to what you're doing. Because all these there's so many successful creators out there, but. How is how is someone you know in the cooking niche making their videos you know so successful? They're getting millions of views, and it's just always like taking inspiration from other accounts and other industries as well, and then you know applying some of those lessons in, in excuse me applying some of those lessons into your own content as well. Yeah, and I think that uh, you know there's probably a ton of people out there that they just don't know what kind of content to create and where to start. Like let's say you know you have a, a, a massive business. Uh, you'd like to really start making content and putting it out there, but you have no idea the social media things for, and you have no idea, like, how could I, with no following right now, go to that million, kind of like you asked earlier. And I think so, in a touch on your point of looking at other niches, I, what I want people to do is if they don't know what kind of content that they want to make, go in your niche and look at the top 10 to 20 to even 30 creators, like pull out a piece of paper or in your notes on your iPhone app and literally write down all those accounts that are successful. Then I want you to go through each of their accounts and their videos and write what videos performed the best and what was the type of content. Did they do an interview? What question was asked? What's the hook? And, and get detailed with it. And then look at that list. And after that, you should probably have, like if you have three per 30, three ideas per 30 content creators, that's 90 video ideas right there. Mm. And you can go through and just circle immediately. Oh, I could do that. I could do that. And you don't want to copy them. You want to put do something similar, but put your own voice into it. And there you go. You have 90 pieces of content that you can pull from right there to get started. I love that. One thing to touch on some of the, all you guys kind of mentioned this subtly is I heard this Mr. Beast interview. And the one thing I love that he said is he said, replace the word algorithm with audience. Mm. Yes. And what I found is, you know, we always go, oh, I'm shadow banned. Oh, it's not pushing my stuff out. What I found is 
if you are putting out unbelievably great content, people are going to like it. They're going to share it and it will preside over whatever the hell is going on with the algorithm. Like, hey, it will be seen. Hey, w what do you say? Great content? Oh, great content always performs. It doesn't matter. It really does not matter. Mm. Yeah. Yep. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be unique. And, and I think that's why we've seen so many people in the last couple years, for example, Hermosi. I mean, it was like a zero to 100 in one year. And maybe, I guess he probably did more, but he, he accelerated so much in that one year. And I think it was more so that his stuff was so insightful and so unique and completely different than anybody else that why would he not be successful? The cream rises to the top. Always. Yeah, absolutely. And to touch on the Mr. Beast thing, uh, you know, people ask him in interviews all the time, what, you know, how can I really blow up how can i how can i do it do i need to change my thumbnail is it the title blah 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 and he always goes back to the fundamental is literally the idea of the video the more time and the more insightful you actually think about the ideas behind your videos the content strategy the more likely it's like hey i could go out and shoot five videos but if i actually took a second to think about and actually work on how could i make this idea the best you know you go out and shoot those five videos with a little bit more insight on the idea is this something my audience is actually going to like then you know chances are it's probably going to perform a lot better it's going to it's going to hit and and he talked about too is he said well we invest over a million dollars per video yeah he's like anything we would make i would just dump it back into my business it was right when i got here um you know, the guy that does all the audio and stuff for the podcast studio he was like man you've blown up the past couple of years like and, and I, I told him that i just had grant cardone on he's like man how are you getting these people blah 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 I said, well, I posted three times a day for four years straight, invested hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, spent hours and hours and hours, engaged with every single person. Like, So it was a bunch of really, really boring work. And then eventually you get a Grant Cardone interview. It's like, hey, I love your stuff. You wanna do a podcast? And so it almost takes years of execution and work to get a really easy conversation that all of a sudden you're in the doors with some of the most, you know, incredible entrepreneurs yeah. in the world. I, Ice Cube said on a podcast one time, he said, you have to be willing to do this shit for five years and not even expect a quarter in return. Yes. So you know, you're, you're underpaid until you're overpaid. And, and, yes. and let me ask you this. How long did it take you to get that first viral video? How, how, how many pieces of content would you say that you put out before you got that first viral video? On TikTok? On any platform in general. So TikTok, I started in 2020. Okay. So right after you guys, and it was still embarrassing. And right. I knew it was going to be big because when I was a little kid, remember when Twitter first started? Yeah. And I remember I made a Twitter and I was like, whoa, why do you have a Twitter? And they, they'd mess with you. And I, was, and I saw Twitter blow up. So when people started messing around and joking about TikTok, I said, oh, this is something. Yeah. I, need to, I need to take a look at this. And so what I did is... I. I didn't do anything crazy like you guys. I was working six, seven days a week building my company. So anytime I would be in my car, I'd just finish lunch or I was charging my Tesla, I would do like a 50 second video. I still don't know how to edit videos. Yeah. So I would just put a 60 second clip with a little title, how to close more deals, how to yeah. scale a business, just whatever. I was like, let's just see what happens. Yeah. And I think it was like video 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. I posted it and, and early on, my most viral videos were always the ones I least expected. Right. So I did it and then I went to dinner and I looked down at my phone and within an hour I had like 100,000 views. Um, and even the same thing, there was, I was at like 30,000 six months in or something like that on TikTok. Yeah. Posted one video before I had a meeting and I was in Houston for business and it went to like 1.4 and then I ended up on Fox News and yeah. I scaled to, so you just, you never know what's gonna happen. But what you guys are saying is, if you're made, if you've made a hundred pieces of content, a hundred pieces of content, and there's no reaction or no results, you need to pivot. Absolutely. Yes. You need to pivot because the one thing I'll say is those first 15 videos, even though they didn't go, go viral, I had not even a thousand followers and I was getting 1500 views in like five, six, seven, eight comments. I love this. Who's your, who are you, man? This is it. So you could tell the audience liked it. And so it, I heard this story of like how to really build a brand is it's better to have a thousand people absolutely love you than a million that just kind of like whatever about you a hundred percent if you can make a thousand people love you you have an unbelievable product and service it's, it's all about a community and, and and being able to build that and that's why you know we were just having a conversation recently and somebody said that like there's two types of like audiences and followers that you can that you have right or the two different components and it's like one 
you know, attention and intention, right? Attention, okay, great. Like, you know, you can get views here and there and all that, but like you wanna create those followers that are intentional to where it's like you tag somebody or you tag something and they're, and you got 10,000 people going there or you post something on your store and you've got, you know, a couple thousand people sliding up every single time. So it's like creating that audience, right? The raving fans where it's like, you always have people that are tuned in. They're wanting to know like, what's next, what's that? And then like, that's, that's ultimately like the most important thing. Yeah, absolutely. So let me let me ask you this. Have you noticed any small in this? And you could watch this video in the next six months and it's completely different because the algorithm does always change. Are there any tips and tricks that you notice on getting more views, more likes, more shares related to Instagram, TikTok? Just like let's assume you have a great product. You got a thousand people that love it. It's growing. Is there any specific things that you guys would make sure that these people do to, to grow their brand? I, I would say first and foremost, and you'd actually touched on this when you're talking about your brand, is that you know when you started making those videos, you said, I didn't know how to edit, but what you did was you started the video with that piece of white tech, the white and black text that said, how to close more deals, how to have better relationships, how to get better at sales, over and over again. It was repeatable, but what is that little white text with the black, the black letter? What is that box? It's the hook. It's the hook of the video. If people just kind of understood the fundamental of like how a video needs to be set up on short form content, you're already ha you're half the battle is already there because you're just when you start making the videos, you're going to be thinking about it. Really, the most important part of the video is the first three seconds. It's the hook. It's what's going to reel people in. Like James mentioned, the scroll stoppers. You get creative with it. Try things different. The hook is what's going to reel people in. And a lot of times when you have that piece of text on the screen that says how to close more deals in a nutshell, people that are interested in sales are going to see that and they're going to be like, well, you know, I, I need to close more deals. So let me actually watch this video and pay attention. What follows that is the retention period. It's how much value can you actually deliver, whether entertainment or information following that hook. And then the close is either you want to reel them in again to watch it one more time or you need a call to action. Like, hey, mm. if you enjoy this video, follow for more, things like that. And that's how you can really compound. Like for us, at the end of every one of our videos in that first year or two, we put read caption in a little text box at the, in the last two seconds of the video. And then in the caption, it would say follow to join the movement at School Hard Knocks. And then we do our normal caption. Mm. And so that, that little piece at the end, anybody that was re actually really invested in one of our videos, we literally told them what to do next. Like, hey, if you like this, Go, go watch more and so just understanding that psychology of hook retention call to action and try to get people to watch the video again uh because watch time is the most important thing that people need to understand watch time and completion rate the two absolutely most important things and just like you said i mean look at in, in today's world it's it's all about the quick dopamine hits people's attention spans are so gone so a, a big mistake that i also notice that a lot of people make especially if we're just talking about personal brands or if it's like a product that they're trying to sell is they make the mistake by assuming that people know who the fuck they are <laughs> <laughs> people just start videos just start they just start talking about a concept when in reality it's like you need to either a start with some sort of credibility statement so if you're a real estate professional who's done nine figure transactions be like you know i've i've raised and sold a hundred million dollars worth of real estate and this is the secret to raising capital as opposed to this is how you raise capital what's going to hook more people in mm -hmm. somebody just seeing that random guy talking about raising capital or is it going to be him talk you know establishing that credibility having that confidence and, and and it's not boasting but it's it's just saying like what you've done to captivate for that right because when you post a video out there 99 percent of the people that see that they've never seen you before right unless you're like kevin o'leary or kevin hart somebody like that that already has that established name people make this they make the mistake by assuming that people know who they are and so i would just say it's very important to be uh, intentional about having those credibility statements and like you said having those well-structured hooks and, and just mixing it up constantly. If, if, yeah. if you're if you're someone that doesn't necessarily have like that credibility statement like let's say you're you're young in your 20s or you you know you're you're in your 30s 40s you just quit your job you're building a business uh we actually i actually got this point from gary v where basically if you don't have that massive credibility statement to put at the beginning just be honest about where you are in the process shift yes. the perspective Sh this is how you can actually drive people in about building that brand and that story those cult followers because you can be just be own, own own yourself own your brand basically be like hey i'm 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 30 years old i just quit my job and this is what i'm doing right now today to start my business and then you go into it and then people are going to relate to that a lot more instead of somebody that's trying to be something that they're that they're not yeah i think there's also two headed ones that people don't really talk about a lot and one is what you're wearing and how because that's an instant way for people to yeah. perceive you right one of the what's one of the biggest things we look for it's the look right it's like do they, do they look like a mogul right because if someone just looks crazy i mean we're probably a not going to go up to them on the street and they're just like probably just not that interesting but two is also your tonality like if you are just yeah and, and today we're gonna be talking about like nobody cares nobody wants to watch that scroll swipe they're moving on 
So I think two hidden ones is A, how you look in the camera, get a haircut, you know, look good. Two is, uh, is, is your tonality. Make sure you sound actually excited to be talking about what you're talking about. I love that. And so and a lot of things that you guys seem to be talking about is just authenticity. That's, that's the key. I have a friend that he's an entrepreneur, but he's, he's young. I think he's 23 now and his brand's really growing. But he says things that no entrepreneur is saying. Like he'll say, so I, I decided we were selling out of all our product and I'm now $83,000 in credit card debt. And everyone's like, what? And then he goes, the reason is, is because I have to invest in my brand. and I need all those materials. It's a big risk. I only got 15 days to make the payment. But when we drop these things, if it sells off, we'll be able to cash flow. And you're like, wow, I like this guy. Like you never hear these type of things when it takes running business, but sometimes that's what it takes. And so just being authentic and unique. And, and also I'd love too is you can tell when people make content because they love it and they're passionate about what they do. And it's something that they just know versus someone that's trying to be a content creator. Mm. What have y'all seen? Like, what are some of the traits of, or, or let me ask you this. What, what are the, some of your favorite people that you've ever given an inter interview to, whether they're big or not? And what do you think made them insightful? So like, I just kind of like some of our like favorite interviews that sure. we've done. I mean, I'll touch on that recent one in Dallas that we just did. Okay. Um, and it was the, uh, the, the, he was the supply chain guy for 40 years, had, had built, I guess, a massive company out there. And that's funny cause he, uh, he DM'd us after the fact and he's got like 40 followers and, and he's like, he's, he's like, nice job kid. Like we set a record or something, like that. <laughs> but he thought it was like super cool. Um, and, and I, I love that just cause of like how like on the go it was. It's like, and that's the thing is like you, you have with these, a lot of these super wealthy people, it's like, you gotta do something to like stand out and like get their time. Like if you go in there, you're not confident. It's like, it's like, dude, they're, they're, they're not going to give you the time, but it's like, if you go in there with intention and, and you, and you kind of are able to like captivate them in there, then it's like, Hey, they're going to have a lot of, um, then they're going to actually like like give you a little bit of time i would say one that i always love to talk about is is we did a, a youtube video going around austin where uh it was like a houses video we were just going up to mansions in, in austin and there was this guy just random ones random houses random houses none of it was set up none of it and and uh this guy steven hicks uh he's on like a youtube partner board he sold a company for a couple hundred million and uh he did the interview outside of the house like he was in like a rope um, oh he's in like a Versace robe and it's funny, like his wife kept coming on like the intercom. So those are just some of like the, like, that's like a crazy one that we did. Um, and I, I would say, you know, we, we always just try, try and a lot, a lot of it is pretty like raw and organic. And then there are times like where it's like, Hey, like if we got this person like set up, we'll do like our thing to like ensure that it is, uh, you know, that it just goes crazy. Yeah. What about you guys? What are some of the favorites? Oh man. Uh, I guess from, from a favorite perspective, I would say that, you know, we just did this one with the, the, this one gentleman, his name's, uh, Kehinde Thomas. And, uh, he, uh, he, he, he dropped a lot of sound bites in there. And I think, uh, one of the, one of the key pieces of advice that he left everybody with is that like life, you know, takes from takers and gives to givers and keeps very accurate accounting. Mm. And, uh, I, I just love that statement. I think, I think another one, one more in there. Yeah. Procrastination, procrastination is the assassination of all, all destination. destination. Mm. You yeah. can't procrastinate anymore because tomorrow is delayed for the labor of the lazy. And that's mm. a fact, man. You know, the amount of times that we talk, that you talk to people that talk about, I'm going to start this channel tomorrow. I'm going to start this business six months from now. They haven't done anything about it. So again, among the most highly successful people is their action takers. I'd say my favorite advice that I've ever heard in any interview was from shout out to Robert Vasquez do you know where the most valuable piece of real estate is? Where? In graveyards, because there's billion dollar ideas sitting in the ground of people that uh. never took action. You know what I mean? And that's the thing is the most successful people is that they were willing to put it all on the table. They're willing to go, you know, it was, uh, we were talking to uh, the, the investment banker in LA and he said that, you know, they did like a, the most, I think it was like the top 80 people on the Forbes list. They're willing to go to like negative 3 million in order to, uh, they, they're willing to risk it all to really become successful. And so I think that people, they get caught up, uh, by again that they, they, they just doubt themselves yeah. you know yeah uh, we I mean we've we've done some pretty cool names uh, we've done Andy Elliott Justin Waller uh, the CEO of Frito-Lay Stephen Williams um, you know Grant Cardone and you know it's it's you know awesome being able to connect with a lot of these people they're actually great people in pe person especially when you get to meet them uh, but oftentimes a lot of the, it's that it's that one on the street that you go up to and they just give that raw advice and you have this interaction that you never thought you could have we we interviewed this one guy in uh rodeo drive in beverly hills uh and we i, I still don't even know if we know who the, who the guy is but basically uh he started the video like i have i have 
uh, he's an older gentleman, and he's like, I have $20 million in cars, but I would I would go back and drive a Kia again if I could be your age again. Yeah. And it's just like it was a great sentimental interview. And so uh, just sometimes just having that conversation, you know, you could learn a lot from. And that's the thing, too, is, is I'll say this. The reason why I, I'm such a proponent of interviewing, like, people that don't have those names is that everybody has their own perspective and story. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of the times we'll often, you know, uh, go up to people when we approach them and, and we'll tell them in our pitch. It's like, you know, we've done interviews with Mark Cuban, the president of Nike, and, and a big rebuttal or something that we'll hear from people is say, well, I'm not no Mark Cuban. It's like, it doesn't matter. You still have your own story and unique perspective that like makes you you and, and somebody is around the world can, can find value within that, mm. you know? Yeah, I think, I think one of my favorite interviews of all time has to be Cody Sperber. Uh, and he ta tells a story about how, you know, he has payroll due the next day, his Amex bill is due, and he doesn't have enough money to cover it all. And it's probably about, I don't know, $200,000, $300,000. And he said, he's sitting on his, on his waterfront property and he's crying in his theater room. And, you know, people view these ultra successful people that, you know, it's more money, more problems, right? And it's not always easy to keep track of like everything you have going on yeah. within the day to day of your business. And he realized, he's like, I'm in this hole and I'm like, what do I do? So he said, he calls up one of his mentors. He said, he's crying on the phone at like two in the morning. He's like, what do I do? What do I do? And the, the mentor says, Cody, what did I teach you? It's, it's sales solves all problems. So what he did, one of the first things, so how he pretty much got around it is he called the Amex company, he was like, hey, here's the situation, here's what's going on. He was able to defer the payment for like 30 days. And then uh, that's when he created an offer and he sold like hell and there he solved the problem. But I, th I think there's a, a misconception that just because you know, you're know you ultra successful and you have you know this big business that you don't have problems, but the reality is you do have problems, the problems just Massive. get bigger. Massive problems. Some of the things I always would tell this to my, my sales managers when they become leaders, because they, when you become a leader, when you start a business, like you were saying, the great, the great entrepreneurs or great business people, whatever, they start fast and they take action. But when you take a lot of action, you, like for example, you go, man, I want to make a million dollars a year. The reason why we want that goal is because we associate making a million dollars with a certain lifestyle or certain things that we believe comes with it. Now, the first things that we think comes with it are all the positive things where I could travel to, the things I could eat, the people I would know, the car I would drive. You associate those things. But what no one tells you and what you almost never hear unless it's a unique interview like that is also the problems and the stress and the sacrifices you have to do to actually get to that level. And everything comes with problems. And I always, I always think about this is, you know, anytime running a company, which, which I've done for the last four years, and we have a problem, I'm like, man, this is so stressful, I don't know how I'm gonna do it. I always look back on previous years where I thought the same thing, and now that problem is now a joke. And so I always tell myself, and that's what I tell anybody that's listening, whatever you're going through right now, if you can't handle it now, how do you expect yourself to do anything more difficult and more challenging and at another level? Because if you got problems running a million dollar business now, can you imagine what they're gonna be like when you're running a hundred million dollar business? You gotta give up a lot of things to, to produce something to that level. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, it's almost, it's almost like, uh, I, I love the video game analogy. Mm -hmm. We're pretty much, you know, in life, you know, life's almost like a video game. Right. Pretty much, you know, you have your character, your avatar, and you got to level up to different levels. But, you know, each level is going to get more challenging. Right. And so you can't beat the game if, you know, you can't beat that that boss level. You know, maybe, uh, you know, level, level one is you have a complaint with a customer working a minimum wage job in your first job as a teenager. But, you know, then... Level four is, you know, you start that first, you start that first business and, uh, you know, you're trying to pitch a, a, a eight figure CEO to come and work with you. And right. it's, it's, you, you got to level up to be able to well, handle those conversations. And, and what I would add on, I think like one of the most important things that anybody could do kind of in that scenario. And I'm sure that you've experienced this is that like, once like you think that you have all these like crazy problems, but at the end of the day, one of the biggest things to solve that is it's really mentorship. And you go and talk to some of these people, right? Like if you're running a million dollar company, you talk to somebody who's running a 10, hundred million dollar company, you tell them all these problems that you're having and in reality to them they, they know how much of a small problem that is compared to like what you're going to deal with like there's levels to the shit you know what i mean like really? that we talk about and really you know the fastest way to collapse time is knowledge genuinely you know like the you want to get from point a to point b it's like finding people that have really been there and and again it's it's reaching out and finding those people like i said they're the most willing people to help in the entire world that was the most surprising thing is you would assume that this guy's you know done all these things and successful they're going to be rude and 
I was talking to Grant Cardone about this is they're some of the most nice, most willing and humble people ever, because if they really got there on their own, not only are they the real deal, but they know how hard it is. And so no one's going to knock. I love the saying. I hope I get it right. But the only person that's going to knock you for starting a YouTube channel when you got only 500 subscribers is someone with 50 subscribers. Yep. Yes. But someone with 500,000 is going to encourage you because they once had that much subscribers too. Same thing with a business. It's, it's just like if a 15-year-old walks into a big room full of people and he's going to tell everybody, hey, I'm going to be a millionaire one day. Everybody in the room is going to laugh except the one millionaire that's in there. He's Because uh, he was that guy. Yes. Yeah. And that's a fact. You know? I love it. So just to close up, what are what are some of y'all y'all's goals? You're three years in. You got four million followers. I'm sure by the end of the year it'll be ridiculous. But what what are some of the things that you want to do? What are some of the things you want to change? What's kind of y'all's targets over the next few years? Absolutely. Number one most important thing is always going to be growth. Four million now. I still think of it as like that's small to me because again we had this conversation when we went out to scottsdale to meet with andy elliott and he told us it's like i'm here my like he's got a phenomenal facility out there big facility really nice and he's telling us about man i just feel small because he's talking about how he was just to andy frisella's place who's just like twice the size so it's all perspective right like we average like over a million views on like an instagram video but like to us it's like it's like it's still we, we still joke around and say we, that, we hey, need 10. hey hey, hey 10. We're, we're still putting up bitch numbers and that's the thing too we do need 10 because people don't realize is that there's something that you can consistently do in your content whatever that you're doing let's just say content for a, an example to consistently hit like a certain number of views like there's something that you can do you may not know it yet to consistently hit a million views in every single video or 10 million for that matter and it's just always like thinking bigger like one of the first times that we'd ever got lunch i remember you telling us this it's like everybody thinks about like hey how can i hit a hundred thousand make a hundred thousand dollars in a year well it's, if you set that a lot bigger it's like yeah you may not hit that but you're gonna fall a lot you know better than being you know i'm not i'm saying be realistic but really it's like shooting for those huge goals and those massive like targets and objectives and that's like super important so i would just say number one for us is always just growth um, how can we get from four to five to 10 million to 20 million, like in the, in the most efficient and effective amount of time? And then, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, two of the fundamentals of why we wanted to start the channel were, you know, did not like the way that financial literacy and just career mentorship were being taught in, you know, the traditional school system. And also we were lucky to have a ton of mentors around us growing up, you know, having that courage to just reach out for that help. And we want to help bring that to a lot of people at scale. So uh, a lot of a lot of the big things we got going is trying to deliver those insights. Uh, we launched a newsletter, uh, also working on building a community that we want to bring all these people together and actually like, hey, how can we actually pair our audience yeah. and, and help them uh, meet some of the people that we've been able to, and be fortunate enough to interview. I don't let you go, but just two last things that I would like say on this that I think is very important for all people, especially in media, content creation, whatever it may be, is that the biggest mistake that I, uh, the two biggest mistakes that people make is number one, people, they go into content creation and they start to get shiny object syndrome. They start to think, man, how can I do this brand deal or turn into this e-commerce company or whatever it may be? And even we ran into that mistake initially when we were starting to really grow is everybody's coming to pitch us to sell this and do that or do that. And we're making an investment here and there. And it's like, dude, remember the vehicle that got you to where you were. And that goes with any business, right? You being in solar, everybody's going to tell you how to run your business, but you know how to run it better than anybody else. It's just like, dude, we are a content company. The minute you start trying to become an e-com brand or do this and that, your, your, your brand's not going to be the same and it's mm. just not going to grow. And you always have to remember your bread and butter. And that's why focus, follow one course until successful. It's one of like, that is genuinely some of the best advice that anybody can have. It's, it's, it's really just becoming an expert at that one thing. And then you can begin to diversify and expand. And then the one last thing I'll say on that is another huge problem that people make and I would say one of the biggest things that made like this so successful and helpful is that we had a team, right? Having that team and, and being able to, and, and then expand from there, right? One of the things that Grant Cardone told us when we were interviewing him is it's like, dude, you guys got three guys on your team. You guys got, you guys got problems. He goes, you look at a company with 30 people, you got problems. You know, you look at Walmart, they have 30,000 employees. They don't have any problems, right? They're a multi-billion dollar company. So it's like bringing people in and a lot of people they'll start to make money and they'll still try to be that solopreneur and wear all the hats themselves when it's like if you can delegate right 
one of our favorite quotes that we always reiterate to other people and ourselves is that I'd rather have a slice of the pie than 100% of the grape because you can bring somebody in and collaborate, especially if you have some sort of value, you're growing an audience, bring somebody in to partner up with on that community who's done that, right? Give, give them a nice chunk of change. Give them that 25%, 30% as opposed to just trying to be greedy and, and have it all yourselves because it's, it's, it's not, in order to really grow, you gotta, you gotta bring people in and you just gotta expand, delegate to elevate. Love that. Yeah, no, that, that's that's phenomenal, and I I couldn't agree more. As well as not just with building a team, but also one of the biggest things that I think we are just it goes above all is our branding. Is mm. we protect the brand at all at all costs, Be between who we interview, what videos we put out. Like once like you know you start out in the volume game, you're trying to make a name for yourself. But once you have a brand and people start to know who you are, protect it. You need to protect it at the all costs. Number one focus on whatever venture that we do is the last. The, the most important thing is that it does not dilute the brand. Mm. And that means if it means giving up on tens of thousands of dollars, that's fine because we have we've given up on so much money to, to, to really protect that because it's it's a media is a long game at the end of the day the minute you start making certain like transitions the minute people start to like lose faith I'd, and hope you know I'd, doing. I'd, I'd rather not give up on a you know a billion dollar paycheck for you know ten thousand dollar posts exactly so. exactly i love it well thank you guys for coming on amazing amazing insights i mean this is a master class on growing a successful brand which is so important so i appreciate it thanks for you guys coming on and obviously exciting things and other than that Hope you guys uh, enjoyed this podcast. Where can we find you guys on social media? The School of Hard Knocks, all platforms. School of Hard Knocks, awesome guys. Well, hope to see you guys soon for uh, the next episode and appreciate the love. Make sure to like and subscribe. Talk to you guys soon.